You know, concerning this book, Titus, is the last of what we call what kind of epistles? Uh-oh. Yep, quiz time. Amen. Hmm? Um, no, they are Pauline epistles, epistles, but specifically they are called pastoral epistles. He wrote those, um, uh, the first two when he was in prison. Actually, you know, as you see, Acts chapter 27 and 28 close out. Um, right after he was out, he wrote the first two, First Timothy and, um, and Titus. And we finished Second Timothy a little while ago, which we know to be the last book that um, the Apostle Paul wrote before he was beheaded. But um, Titus, we saw here, you know, Titus uh, shares a distinction along with Timothy of uh, being that Paul uh, specifically called them his sons in the faith. Timothy was a pastor, amen, at uh, Ephesus. Titus, he leads him to set order in Crete. You know, he's somewhat of a troubleshooter. So Paul was sent into different areas. Here he's in, in Crete, um, uh, the, the city of Crete. Um, he's gone to Damas Dama Damasia and some other cities for the Apostle Paul. But wherever he went, God sent him to bring order. And so he said, in, as we saw last week, an order concerning the qualifications for those that would serve in the office of elders and, and, and pastors or bishops and overseers in the church. And he gives us those qualifications for him, as we saw on last week. And that, that was coming up through verse 9. Tonight we're going to go through verses 10 through uh, 16. And uh, in these, the primary topic is dealing with false teachers. And he begin, begins to confront this thing and tells us how we are to deal with false teachers in our current day. Um, there are a lot of false teachers around today, a lot of false teaching. And you and I, you know, we need to be on guard so that we don't be uh, led astray. Unfortunately, too many are. But here we find him telling them in this church, it's in Crete, you know, this is what you're going to do with those that he labels uh, false teachers and what they seek to do. All false teaching has an agenda. And, and generally when someone is a false teacher, they, they have enough mixture in, in the false teaching to make it acceptable to you and I. You know, there'll be a seed of truth that if, we, if we're not discerning it, it'll draw us into it. We say, well, I remember seeing that in the Bible, but where they took you to wasn't biblical. And so you and I as believers, this is an encouragement to you and I to learn to be discerning concerning what we hear. And here he begins to address it. So let's read verses 10 through uh, 16, and then we'll come and we'll go through those and pull out uh, some truths from them and unpack them. Let's read aloud together. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Sound to me like the apostles laying them out. Amen. See, this church, this area where he is in Crete, you know, it's another hard case, amen. But Paul has established a ministry there. Uh, he, he, he had to depart. He sends Titus there to set order um, so that this church could become opposite of what we're reading here. And it's full of unruly people. So let's begin to look at these verses. This 10th verse says, for there are many. Now he's given them, we see in the prayer verses, instructions for the type of people that they need to set in order set in position in the church. He said they need to have a clean life, need to be married to one woman, amen. Um, blameless, you know, if people lie on them, that's one thing, but they ought to live a life above reproach, clean living, uh, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, amen. Uh, not a striker, not, not serving for money's sake, but love people, 
they're hospitable. And then after all that he says, for there are many unruly and vain uh, talkers and deceivers. So in this church that he's in, he's given them this, this is what we need in leadership, but we have among us people who have these certain attributes. And he's beginning to tell them how to deal with these false teachers that are in the church. See, the church being the body of Christ, amen, Satan loves to infiltrate uh, the church. One of his primary agendas, you know, now there are no perfect Christians, so there are no perfect uh, gatherings of worship, of worship in church when we come together, amen. But he likes to get in and bring a mixture even into that so as to lead people astray. That's pretty much his agenda for every assembly is, is to find a way to get someone in it to pull us away from what we know to be true. And he's saying here in this particular church, there are many unruly. Somebody say unruly. Amen. That word unruly means that they resist authority. Amen. You know, you might know somebody. Now, I know you're not one. Amen. But in this particular church, now, we'll find out because they are Christians. Uh, that word has a certain uh, weight to it that we'll see in a little bit. But there were, this church had a lot of unruly people in it. They were resistant to authority. And uh, you and I are called to be on the authority, first to Christ, amen. Then we're to be in submission to the Spirit of God, the Word of God, amen. We're to learn to submit ourselves one, one to another, as the Bible teaches, amen. We're to submit in our relationships. In other words, we're not to be unruly. It means that nobody can have guide and influence over our lives in a way that is beneficial to us. And there's a lot of that in today's church and um, among the body of Christ where People don't want to be to told. You know, I remember years ago somebody said that here we expect the people to live right. Well, we do. Every church ought to expect those who know Jesus to live right. Amen. Now, the person that put that rumor out was unruly. <laughs> you know, because in the house of God, nobody's holding a, anything over anybody's head to drive people. Amen. But we all as believers ought to have a certain way that we carry ourselves. The Bible says that uh, they will know that we're his children by our what? Amen. Our fruit, yes, amen, and our love. So there ought to be something unique and distinct about us. We're not perfect, amen, but we're on the way to it, amen. We serve Jesus as much as to the best of our ability, and we ought to get better at serving as we mature in him, shouldn't we? But here, like in most um, assemblies, there will be unruly people among us, amen. Some will hear what's being said and talk, and they might nod their head to it, and they'll come around to you later and say, can you believe what, can you believe that? <laughs> amen, I can't believe he said or she said that, amen. Well, some people are unruly, and that is something that we have to deal with in the midst because they're, these are people relationships. Now, we might be walking in some mission to the things of God now, but it might be a point that we weren't that way. And we had to learn how to uh, have someone have the rule or the guide over us. Uh, that's generally what it means. They're unguidable. Nobody can tell them what direction their life ought to be in. And so when the Bible says we ought to obey those that have the rule over us, amen, it's saying in a pastoral sense, it means have the guide, responsible to watch out for your soul, responsible to give you the pure word of God, amen. And, and, to, and that word, when we follow what we're being taught, is a guide for our lives. And it should agree with the, the guidance and leading of the Spirit of God. But to the unruly, they resist it. Amen. They're always coming against, looking for excuses to justify not doing what they know the Bible says. And, um, you know, so they are challenged sound doctrine. We're going to see that Paul is once again going to tell him here what to do and to teach sound doctrine. Doctrine is what? Teaching, amen, instruction, amen, telling us how to get it right, amen, how to stay right. And so they're unruly, and notice the second word he uses here, vain talkers, and thirdly, deceivers. What well, the vain talkers are, those who just talk. They, senseless talkers is what the Greek term means, amen. In other words, they talk more about how they ought to live, but they don't actually live it. Now, there's another word, amen. See, a lot of people can talk it. They talk the talk. I'm a Christian, but can they walk the walk? Amen. Now, the operative word, you know, they're acting, they're talking like what they're not acting like. Somebody say hypocrite. 
Amen. See, that comes under the head of senseless talkers. You know, they profess it, but they're not possessing through walking in it. And so he's saying, look, these are among us, and he's going to tell us in verse 11 what to do with them, because they are opposing authority, they are unruly, unruly they are vain talkers, and gossiping plays into that as well. And, um, but they are more given to talk than to practice, and that's why I call them hypocrites. Amen. Now, this, and then he said thirdly, and this is just in verse 10, and deceivers. And he said that this group of um, unruly, vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. These are Jews that are, within, that are within this church. Well, the reason why Paul mentions that specifically or specially uh, those of the circumcision is because this was a Gentile church. Amen. You know, they were people who were formerly um, either Gre Greco or Greco-Roman, amen, or, or just straight out of paganism, and now they are saved and in the body of Christ. But you have Jew uh, Jews who are among them, just like they were in the book of Galatians, trying to bring them under the law and trying to subvert the teachings. That's what Paul, Paul means. These people, this, this Jewish element in this particular church is unruly in the sense that they won't come under anybody's guide or rule, and they're beginning to teach these um, Gentile believers that they don't have to follow these New Testament believer, uh, teachings that uh, Paul is teaching. They're, they're seeking to bring them back under the bondage of the law. And Paul is going to have some hard words for anyone who seeks to do that. And that's why he calls them senseless talkers. Amen. They're trying to subvert them or to bring them back into bondage. What deceivers here... In the Greek term, it means a man misleader. So that lets us know that this uh, operation against them is to make an appeal to their thinking, to get them to reason. And when you begin to reason, you can actually reason yourself away from truth. That's how a lot, a lot of people uh, walk away from Christianity because someone comes and they begin to practice as a deceiver this man, man misleading tactics. Amen to get them to think wrong. Now, the word tells us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And this is why we're to guard our minds. Peter talked about lust that war against a man. Our primary warfare is right here, amen, in the man. Amen. Satan wants to make an appeal to our reasoning to get us the reason opposite of what God has been telling us. And that way we can be brought into bondage and we'll fall. Amen. And, um, and so, manned misleaders. I thought there was a, um, um, a unique meaning, amen, concerning deceivers. Amen. Because if you think wrong, you act wrong. Our actions always follow how we think. And so, if the enemy can get us to think differently about ourselves, about how we're to live, about what's right and wrong, than, than what the Bible says, then he can bring us into bondage and lead you and I into sin. Now, how is this manifest today? Amen. Well, we see this mental operation used against us every day. Amen. Uh, what we called, um, it used to be the, the news, um, is not reporting news now. It's presenting what we call a narrative to get you to think a certain way, get you to think a certain way about Christianity. Amen. It's generally portrayed in a negative light in, in the media today, isn't it? Uh, to get you to think, uh, see, this man misleading tactic to get you to think wrong um, about um, what's right and what's wrong. Isaiah 5, 20 says they are called good, evil, evil, good, and replace sweet, bitter, and bitter for sweet. Well, we see these things happening on a daily basis. Truth is not what our media is about today. It's to sway your thinking, to align you with their worldview. And the worldview predominantly is against the things of God. That's why they try and mislead you concerning what uh, relationships are between male and female and what one is. Amen. See, that's misleading the man because if we think wrong, you know, one actually came out the other week and said that we need to stop calling pedophiles pedophiles. Call them, um, 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 uh, 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 what they said, uh, uh, like a kid attraction. That's not the exact term they use. No, it's still pedophile. But see, whoever controls the language, if you've never read 1984, George Orwell's book that was written probably 50 or more years ago, 
you know, you know, talking about double speak and um, and man speak and how that you manipulate words to control how people think. Now the guy wasn't even a believer, but he was prophetic in what he wrote because that's what we see happening now. You redefine the word, and you begin to ban to the redefinition, and you begin to think wrongly. Man misled, and once you begin to think wrong, Amen. You are beginning to move in that direction. We see it all the time. I know just on yesterday, they were, they were out there celebrating um, uh, this bill and that there's no more inflation. Same day the report came out, it went up to 8.3%. Amen. You know, and so, but the, mislead, the mi misleading came in the statements that were made. Stock market fell by 1,200 points. Amen. But see, what they're saying and what's actually ha happening are entirely different. See, it's to mislead, mislead us to get us to a place of false security. Amen. Nobody was talking yesterday about an impending train strike. And, you know, and none of those things, you know why? Because if, if it's not out there in front of you, you can be led to a place of uh, false security. Now, I want to tell you, saints, you should never let your guard down. Now, they used to tell me when I was a car salesman, and it wasn't about the salesman. It was about the customer who was trying to buy a car. They say if their lips are moving, they lying. Now, you'd be safer to believe that about what you hear daily. <laughs> Amen? Because now it's not news. It's narrative to get you to believe a certain way. See, that's how we're to understand how the world works. Amen? You know, I know the VP said yesterday as well, our borders are secure. Have you seen all those people walk, running across the border? They're not secure. Amen. See, that's to intentionally mislead you to get, get you uh, insecure. Amen. And so even though we're not in a nation called Crete, this nation is becoming like Crete. I'm a, and once you find out what Cretans were defined as, you'll see that what he's talking about then directly applies to our, our day. It's amazing how the Bible, um, well, that's evidence that it was penned not by man, by the Spirit of the living God, because it was written 2,000 years ago, this New Testament, the entire Bible, amen. Um, but it's relevant right to where we are now. The, address, the issues addressed then are still pertinent to us today. And that's because God knows all, but it's also because God also knows that people are people. We still the same now as we were back then, Amen. So we need to do the same thing to get it right as they were instructed to do. So all these vain talkers, unruly folk, and deceivers, he says specifically Jews. Verse 11, he tells us what ought to be done with them. He begins, now remember Titus is Paul's troubleshooter. And so he's going to tell him what to do here. Amen. Because what these uh, Judaizers were teaching was a combination of um, a mixture of legalism. Amen. You know, that they needed to I practice the law. When we're not saved by law, we're saved by grace. Amen? Uh, Jesus also accused him at one point teaching um, the traditions of men. Amen? And he said traditions of men make um, the gospel of none effect. They were also trying to introduce mysticism. Uh, we will call that, that Gnosticism into the church. This concept that there's a certain knowledge that is kind of hidden from the average person unless you initiate it. That was the biggest enemy that the apostle addressed in his different epistles to the early church. Colossians addresses Gnosticism. Here he talks about it. He talks about it in Galatians. He don't use the term Gnosticism. Amen. And one he uses the word sense falsely called. Amen. This hidden knowledge that's for certain elect. And no, uh, God has nothing hidden from you and I. Amen. He said that we might freely know the things that are given us of God. Yet they're in this church teaching these false doctrines. And so verse 11, he tells Titus, this is what you're to do. Stop their mouth. <laughs> Amen. Shut them up. He says, whose mouths? That sounds kind of hard, don't it? Whose mouths must be stopped. Don't allow it. That's really a call for us in the church, not to allow certain things to just go along. We're to confront it. And what we've been sold in the church is a non-confrontational -con gospel. We don't want to confront people. Amen. I'm not stand up now. Amen. We, we, we don't want to confront people in the church today, do we? No, no. We want to be loved. 
Amen. Well, sometimes the best way I can love people is to confront them in their error. Amen. If they go to hell, let it be over us trying all that we can to confront the false lies that they believe. Amen. And bring them to the truth. He said here, whose mouths must be stopped. And then he tells us why we need to stop it. Amen. Now, if you, you can only stop what you confront. You know, if a pastor is a shepherd, that means the wolves get in among us. We got to deal with wolves. Paul warned in Acts chapter 20, amen, I think verses 28 to 32, he said, after my departure, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. See, he wants to get people in among us, their false brethren, amen, to subvert and lead people away from the gospel of Christ, amen. You know, once they are spotted, they need to be dealt with, amen. And so he says their mouths must be stopped. Why? Because they will subvert whole houses. See, that's the enemy's, that's his motive there, to subvert, to turn their household from the faith. That's what subversion is, to turn you away, to come up under you, to turn you away from, from the truth you know to be true. Amen. To reason you away from this gospel. Their intent is to subvert whole houses, teaching. See, false teachers teach. Teaching things which they ought not. Amen. And that's the motive to turn you from the faith. And their end goal is monetary gain for filthy lucre's sake. See, if someone has a money motive, invariably they're going to be led astray. You know, we've seen a lot of those schemes in the body of Christ over the years. Church pyramid schemes. Amen. You know, in the past we got caught up on a few, but thank God we grew out of it. Amen. Remember, we used to go cha-ching. <laughs> Amen. Only the ones at the top were getting wealthy. Amen. God does want to bless and prosper his people. Amen. But he don't have to use schemes to do it. Amen. The blessing of the Lord, it can make rich and he has no sorrow to it. Amen. God will take care of us as people. But people got in and they began to subvert houses and it introduced into the body of Christ a thing that we're still battling with, this concept of approved selfishness, where the gospel is all about you, where people serve Jesus for what's in it for them. Y'all know that's true, don't you? And if they don't get their bigger house, their new car, their miracle, their season, their harvest, their destiny, and breakthrough, they get offended at God and walk away. Amen. That wasn't necessarily their fault. That was when people crept in and they subverted whole houses through abusing the gospel but it was a seed of truth that God can he will prosper us he will provide our needs but when it's taken to an extreme and it's placed up to the selfish intent of people it led a lot of people astray and so you can't get people who are looking j just after their own interests they're not going to witness to people mm -mm. amen because there's a cost in sharing the gospel and one of the main ones is your comfort. See, unfortunately, we taught Christianity to be a comfortable thing for you to do. We find it out now, if you hang around a few more years, it won't be comfortable. Amen. Hallelujah. It'll be like in a lot of other nations, we're preparing. Amen. If the Lord don't come soon. Amen. And so selfish believers will fall off. Amen. And have been subverted because some used it for, used the gospel. Amen. For simple gain. See, then nothing new is happening in this church. Why? Because people are the same. And they were teaching for filthy lucre's sake. Note verse 12. He said one of them, see, Paul would call out people. And uh, in today's church, we don't want to do it. Amen. Paul compares them to Cretans. This group of Jews who are teaching to subvert and bring people from grace back to the law. Amen. To bring them back in the bondage. Uh, he says, um, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. <laughs> now, generally we read through something like that, don't we? And we said, well, you know, I asked this question, what's a Cretan? What's a, a Cretan? 
Amen. Who were they? And uh, you remember how, what was the church at Corinth known for? Amen. You know, what was Paul confronting it in Corinth? And when he wrote, remember, each letter is written to address a problem. Her own mother-in-law committing incest in the church. But see, current was known for sin. The city was a city given over to sin. And so you, if you were a ranked sinner, some of them might say, man, you, you just like the Corinthians. You know, it had a reputation. It was known for the sin, that city. And because people were saved in that city, they brought some of the sins into the church, and they, they had to be taught as new believers. No, no, this is not permissible. Amen. He said you need to deal with this guy. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Put him out. And so they did it. They practiced church discipline. Amen. Now, in 2 Corinthians, that guy repented. And Paul said to that same church, receive him. Amen. That he not be overcome or overwhelmed with over, over much sorrow. In other words, they had to set discipline because these people who were new to Christianity, they didn't know what Christians were to do. And so we see in some of these letters them setting the order, laying the standard for how you and I are to live as believers. Now here he says that, look, one of them, a, a prophet, said the Christians are always liars. See this um, place, this city in Crete, it had a reputation somewhat like current. Amen. Ephesians was known for their idolatry, uh, their worship of Artemis or Diana. Amen. And they had to confront that as well. Paul confronted it in Acts, didn't he? Amen. Remember that little sorceress, that little girl that was running around that um, um, he dealt with it? And they got him on that, and then he stood up and preached, and they shouted him down for, for two hours. Amen. But he confronted, he dealt with the sin of that city, which was wholly given. The Bible says to idolatry. Well, current was involved in certain areas of sins. Crete was known for liars. And, and so here's a city that has a reputation. That didn't mean everybody there. Everybody in current wasn't practicing sin. But they were known for it. And, um, you know, some churches can be known for the behavior of certain folk. Unfortunately. That's true, isn't it? Don't mean everybody in that um, um, Assembly practices what a few do. Amen. But if some of y'all go out and act the fool, they'll say, see them people over there harvest. <laughs> Amen. See, they label the whole church, won't they? Amen. Same thing here. Everybody in Crete were not living as a liar. Amen. But the reputation was already earned. Amen. Matter of fact, the word Christian, it means to speak like a Cretan, a liar. And so when this prophet, um, who was known, I actually looked him up. I think I left it in my office. But anyway, uh, several centuries before, this prophet, they counted him a prophet, Plato and some of the others did, and made some statements about them that they found to be true. That's why in the next verse, Paul said what this prophet from out among them said was true, that they were liars. And this man had said some things a few hundred years before that brought out to be true. He didn't say the man was lying. He said, verse 13, this witness is true. Amen. The Cretans are always liars. There are some places today known for their sin. What do you think about when you think about Washington, D.C.? Huh, liars. Full of politicians. They tell you anything to get in. Amen. What do you think about when you think about California? Huh, sin, certain sins. Amen. They say it starts in California and works away east. How many of y'all heard that before? Amen. And so it's known for a loose living lifestyle. Yes, a beautiful area, but it's known for the sin that it promotes. What, 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 what state is known for gambling? Las Vegas. Las Vegas, Nevada. Amen. See, everybody in Las Vegas in the, in the gambling at it. But the state has a reputation based on a primary practice there. That's the same here. You know, the Cretans, yeah, they're known as liars, even though all the people in Crete don't practice what the Cretans are known to do. Amen? But you get labeled, don't you? 
Amen. Cities have gotten labeled. We see states have gotten labeled. Amen. Everybody in D.C. in the liar. And every politician in the liar. Amen. The ones who labor and in obscurity that you don't hear about, there are a lot of believers there. Amen. Um, you know, but there's a corrupting influence there. And if someone goes into an area and you, you don't understand the principality you deal with, the spirits that rule that area, they can sway you even as a believer. And that's why a lot of well-meaning people will get into certain areas of involvement and they'll be, become corrupted because they don't deal with the spirit of that area. It's influencing them. Amen? You know, some people think when in Rome, do as the Romans do. No, we don't. We do as Jesus would do. Amen? We can't allow the sin of the city, amen, to dictate how we act. So he says here, what do you do with the Cretans <laughs> that are among you? What do you do with them that are subverting the gospel? And so he says, look, the witness is true. And he called them some names. He said, they're always liars. That's the reputation this city had, amen. And um, he said they also, uh, uh, he called them evil beasts, didn't he? And he called them slow bellies. That really mean they were given the gluttony. They were gluttons, amen. And so they were liars, evil beasts, and gluttons. Not all of them, but the influence in that city was given over to those types of behaviors. And uh, had you ever noticed you can get in certain environments and you can feel a tendency to get pulled in a certain direction. Amen. See, that's a spiritual thing. Amen. You got to resist that. We can't follow along with it. We got to take a stand against it. Know what Paul said in the next verse. What does he say to do about it? Rebuke sharply. Amen. This is how you handle this influence that is in these uh, believers through those who are coming in to lead these houses astray. Amen. This is how you're going to deal with uh, those who are of the circumcision who are intentionally trying to pull these people away from the simplicity of serving Jesus. You know, that was an issue in the book of Hebrews, too. You know, you had people who had come out from Judaism who were born again of the Spirit of God. But because of that, you know, it cost them to get saved. You know, sometimes when they got saved, it will cost them their family inheritance. You know, uh, those who were Jews couldn't receive them anymore because that they were seen as abandoning the faith, even though they really embraced the true faith. And there was pressure put on these Christian Jews to go back under the law. And this is a primary warning in the book of Hebrews. And so Paul would compare the ministry of Jesus to angels. He said his ministry was better than that, better than the law. Amen. Better than the high priest. A ministry of Jesus is the great high priest. Amen. Why? Because they were being drawn away. And that's why Paul, that's why he warned them in Hebrews 10 not to look back. You know, don't go back into what you were delivered out of. See, in every region, in every area, there's a pressure that can come on us to go back from what we believe. I believe that's why a lot of people profess Christ, but they don't walk it out because the pressure comes their way to try and pull them back. And if they, they don't know how to resist it, if they don't take a stand and rebuke it sharply, the, the quicker you take a stand against it, the better off you'll be. Amen? You know, send old friends your way and they'll try and woo you back in. Amen. Well, you need to let them know straight off, no, I serve the Lord Jesus now. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, I, mm, we'll see. Yeah, you will see. Amen. Then they invite you to join in with them. Nope. Well, they might not believe you at first. But if they try, keep trying. You need to rebuke that. And sometimes you need to separate from it. Amen. Paul is telling them in the, in the church, rebuke them sharply. Now, remember, he's talking to Christians who, who are being pressured to be pulled away from the faith. And Paul is going to defend them. He's going to fight. He's telling Titus, get in there. You fight for these people. Rebuke those who are trying to draw them away and do it sharply, cuttingly. Don't play with it. Wow. And this is how we need to be in the church. Amen. See, we've got to watch. Amen. Uh, we got to guard the house of God. Amen. And uh, we need to, as a pastor, that's part of the shepherd's ministry. A rod and a staff are there for, to use. Amen. 
and drive away the wolves. Amen? And so that means that we have to take stands against certain things that seek to creep into the house of God that want to infect you and I as people of God. We need to stand against it. Amen? Paul didn't say they were lying. He said, nope, that witness is true. Wherefore, rebu rebuke them sharply. Deal with it pointedly. Don't let it keep going. Amen. And um, correct and expose it. That's literally what the rebuke means there. Expose it. Now, Ephesians 5.11 tells you and I, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Expose it. Amen. So part of what we're to do, amen, when these things are on the cover, Amen. Trying to draw you and I away. We need to expose it. You know, the, Satan doesn't like um, light. He's a creature of darkness. Amen. And seeing don't like light. Amen. You know, you know when, so they don't come in bolder. They come in to subvert, beginning quietly. By the time Satan raises up his head boldly in a congregation, is after he felt like he and he, he now has the upper hand. Amen. Well, he won't get the upper hand if the shepherd stands up. And if individual believers don't, within that flock don't give place to the false teaching that somebody is trying to sow among you. Amen. So we need to stay on guard even more in this day to rebuke, correct, and expose and do it in a way of need be uh, that it may sound cutting, but we love you enough to call it out. That's one of the reasons why, you know, we do exposés from time to time. Certain things need to be exposed that Satan is trying to bring in and among uh, uh, the body of Christ that we want to be warned about so we won't get caught unaware. Amen. We need to understand what the adversary is seeking to do. Amen. And what the world is trying to bring into the people of God to compromise us in our walk. And there are a lot of things competing today to subvert the church of God. Amen? You know, one of the main ones is this issue of marriage. You know, rather than reprove certain things and call it out boldly, too many preachers are trying to accommodate. Amen? Well, that's not being loving. Yeah, it is being loving. You know, I'd rather love God and be hated of men than to have men love me and get rejected of God. Amen? Amen. Truth does not change. Now, see, he loves everyone, but he won't accept everybody on their terms. Amen? Sometimes people say, well, you know, if I were God, well, you're not. Amen. Amen. If I hear my way, you don't. Jesus is the way. Yeah. Amen. Amen. See, we need to firmly and boldly stand on his word and let that be the standard. And then he can defend us. Amen. And um, even though we might walk through the fire, we'll never go through it by ourselves. Amen. Amen. So part of being that glorious church, I mean, it has to be a church then that is doing and standing and defending against those things that are seeking to uh, infiltrate and weaken us in our walk with Jesus. Amen. And so when a group comes in, uh, I was hearing someone just the other day, and they were saying that um, in the particular church they were in, you know, they brought a teacher in to teach Sunday school who was a Calvinist. And so even though the church don't believe that, you know, he believed in the fad, um, you know, unconditional grace that, you know, if it's God's will for you to be saved, you'll be saved no matter what you do. You know, you can't resist it. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And even though the pastor don't teach that, this guy insists on teaching that. But he hasn't been set down. Amen. See, that's how subversion would work. He said, well, I need someone to feel that and not watching over what they're teaching. And all of a sudden, that thing can infect the congregation. Amen? And rather than rebuke it, allowing it, because whoever we put in front of you, what they teach, 
Most people say, yep, that's got our sanction. That's why you got to guard your pulpit. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in faith, that they may be healthy. See, the intent is not to hurt and destroy anyone. It's to bring them into help. You know, sometimes to, you know, have to lance a bull. Amen. And um, sometimes to really get healthy, they got to cut something out of you, don't they? Well, the process of the operation can be painful. It can be sore afterward. But the intent of the operation wasn't to kill you. It was to make you sound and healthy. You know, if there's something attached to us that's trying to consume us, if we take it out, then the rest of you is healthy. That's kind of the thought I have when I think about that. When he talks about um, sound in faith, amen, there are things eating at, undermining their faith. He's saying you need to take a stand against it, rebuke those things sharply, not to hurt them. You're not trying to embarrass people. You're not trying to belittle people, but you want to get cut off of them. And it takes the word and the spirit to do that, don't it? The word is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. Well, then the word through the anointing of the Holy Spirit can do the cutting, but it cuts off of us, and sometimes it's painful. When you recognize, man, I thought I was right all my life. Yep, but I was wrong. Amen. Cut it off. Amen. And yes, sir. Is this to bring them back into the faith? To bring them back into the faith, that they might be sound in the faith. Why? Because something was pulling them away. They were becoming sick, unhealthy. And um, one of the terms for not being healthy, that individual is not sound in body in them. So the purpose here is to bring them back into a state of health by getting out of them the thing that is weakening. And if it happens to be a group of people that is subverting their house, then rebuking them is part of it. Amen. Exposing what's being done and uh, addressing it and then moving on to get the body back healthy. Sound in, now notice it said not sound in faith, but sound in the faith. The faith. Amen. See, we can read that and say, well, praise God, you know, yep, my faith is, no, no. He's not talking about just simply having faith. That term, the faith, is what he uses in Jude as well, Jude, the third verse where he says that we should earnestly contend for the faith that was once given unto the saints. Amen? Amen. In Luke 18, 8, Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith in the earth? He's not simply talking about believing to receive. He's talking about the body of truths that we hold to as believers. There's only one Lord. That's Jesus. One faith, one baptism, one hope. Amen? There's only one name given under heaven by which men can be saved, the name Jesus. Amen? That's John, amen, uh, where he says in John, hey, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We have to hold to that truth. And yet there are a lot, to, oh, man, I, 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 don't have, I, would, I should have printed and brought it out. You know, a latest poll that I saw said that like 37% of preachers, pastors, believe that being good can get you to heaven. See, the problem in the congregation, in the congregation, is us in the pulpit. Amen. How could that be true? It's not. You know, so that needs a sharp rebuke. The Bible doesn't teach that. But someone has crept in. And they're trying to get it easy. It is easy to be saved. All you got to believe is believe what the Bible says about Jesus. Turn from your sins, call on him, and you're in. You need to repent. Amen. Hey, not, hey God's wrong, right. I'm wrong. Amen. He is the way, not me. I can't make my way. He already made it. Get right with God. Amen. It's the way of the transgressor that the Bible says is hard. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, what did he say about his yoke? He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, my, for my yoke is what? Easy, my burden light. Amen. 
it's easier to serve Jesus than be under the weight of sin, driven by addictions, amen, overcome with lust and desires, amen. Much better to serve Jesus, amen. But when those influences get in among us, they can try and say, well, you know, all you got to do is just live the best way you can. God knows your heart. Universalism crept into the church. Everybody going to heaven. No, it didn't. Amen. And so even though you and I don't believe these things, there are segments of the body of Christ that are influenced by these things. And so when false teaching is among us, we need to address them and deal with them. Amen. And even if it isn't among us, we need to put it out there so you'll be on guard if it tries to creep up on you. Amen. So he says, rebuke sharply that they may be sound in faith, the body of truths that we know to be true. Amen. Jesus is God's only begotten son. He is the way. Amen. Amen. There's a hell to shun. It's real. And praise God, there's a heaven to gain. It's real too. Amen. Joining the church can't get you saved. That's kind of prevalent in this area. Isn't it? Thought to be, well, I belong to the church. No, you don't belong to the church. You got to be born into it. You joined it. No, you joined an organization. You're birthed into the body of Christ. Amen. For by one spirit are we all baptized into the body of Christ, whether we be Jew, Gentile. Amen. Male, female, bond, the free. We all drink of that one spirit, don't we? Amen. See, the basic doctrines of Christianity, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 1 and 2 talks about them. Uh, uh, the principle of Christ, amen. Leaving those, moving on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, number one. Amen. You got to recognize that you need to turn from our, we need to turn from our wicked ways and call on Jesus. Number two was faith toward God. Number three was the doctrine of baptisms into Christ. Baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Those were part of the doctrine of Christ, amen. The resurrection of the dead, amen, and the world to come. Those, were, those are basic tenets of the faith. We need to settle those issues, amen, and stand on those so that we don't get moved. Because Paul said to the church in Galatia, you know, he was amazed that they had so quickly been moved away from the faith. Because people came in, and he had to warn them that if I were an angel, preach any other gospel than that which you know, curse them. Let them be anathena. Amen. Let them be accursed. We need to hold to the truth of this gospel because it's under attack. Okay. You got all of that out of verse 13? Mm-hmm. Amen. Yep. Amen. So we need to hold fast to this body of beliefs that we know to be true. They're under attack. And we need to hold fast. He goes on to also warn them. Verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables. See, he isn't attacking Jews. He's warning against these false teachings that Jews who see these new believers are trying to pull them away back into Judaism. And he's calling those teachings fables, that mixture of legalism. Amen. Men's traditions and mysticism. You see, you don't go back to that. Don't give heed to those fables, uh, such as being saved by keeping the law. That was a big issue in the early church, wasn't it? Amen. Nope, we're saved by grace. Amen. By grace, I will say through faith. Galatians 3.21 says, For if there had been a law given which could have get, uh, given life, verily righteousness should have come by the law. The law can't save. Now, Galatians 3, Paul said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When we realize we can't keep the 10. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, and James made it, the Lord's half brother he made it even plainer. He said, if we failed in one, we blew them all, basically. Amen. You know, and so since we couldn't, Jesus lived and he kept the law perfectly. So that when we come to him, we can be saved by grace. Amen. And he said if we could just keep two, love God 
and your neighbor is yourself. You know, we couldn't even do that. Amen. No law can give life. And this is one of the things they were being led into back under the law. He said, no, that won't work. Rebuke it. Amen. So verse 14, um, he tells them these things are fables and the commandments of men that turn from the truth. And a lot of things that people can teach will lead you away from the true word and the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And um, we really need to be on guard for the Christians that were trying to come on among us and those that bring fables in among us. Amen. The commandments of men that turn from the truth. Verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure. We've heard that a lot. That's been misapplied. Amen. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their man and conscience is defiled. And that's what the enemy is after, to defile our man and to corrupt our conscience. Amen. Sin hardens our conscience. Where conscience means with knowledge. You know, you can sear your conscience by constantly disobeying the word of God. You can harden your conscience. That happened to Pharaoh, didn't it? Amen. You know, well, we want to keep our conscience tender. And we do that by obeying when we know to obey. Amen. You know, when we feel that conviction, we know we're wrong. You might even know at that point what, exactly what you've done. Amen. But when your conscience is bothering you, you need to check yourself and find out why. Amen. Because if we don't keep that area in our heart tender, we can get a little callous to sin. And like a callus, you know, get a callus on your hand, you don't have as much feeling because that skin over it is hardened. Amen. So for you and I, if we mess up, let's don't hold to it. The minute you know you blew it, repent then. Amen. Because the more we gloss over and make excuses, well, God, you know, I'm just a human. No, they didn't make no excuses. Lord, I blew it. Amen. See, David did that. In Psalms 51, when he repents after he's confronted with his sin, you know, he penned that psalm. Now, we all know what happened with David. Amen. But the genesis of what happened with David wasn't when, when he looked out there and he saw Bathsheba up on the roof. It was when he didn't go to war when men went to war. Had he been out there fighting, he wouldn't have been up on the roof. Amen. In other words, he was at ease when he should have been at war. In other words, idleness, they used to warn us about that when we were growing up. You know, they said, idle man is devil. There's some truth in that. Amen. See, we got to guard and watch over our thoughts, don't we? Amen. And we shouldn't be relaxing when we ought to be busy. Amen. But when David was confronted by the prophet, his righteous indignation was stirred. And he said, the man ought to die. The prophet said, you the man. And rather than behead the prophet Nathan, David repented. Amen. See, he could have had Nathan put away. But rather than do that, he acknowledged his sin. But also in Psalms 51, he said, before thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. We have to realize even though our sins might be against other people, it hurts the heart of God as well. Amen? And it's a sin against him. It's against his nature. And so he repented of his sin. That kept his conscience from being hardened so that later on when he inherited the kingdom, is there anybody left of the house of Jonathan that I can show kindness? Of the house of Saul that I can show kindness? For Jonathan's sake. Where there's a seed, it's covenant kindness. New Testament would be grace. And he had a son named what? Mephibosheth. There was a place called Lodabar that kind of meant hopeless and without hope. And he went and got him and set him at his table. See, his heart stayed soft toward God because he acknowledged his sin. And we have to resist that hardening 
that can come on us if we don't. Because he said, look, even a man in conscience is defiled. And the evil we see in our day, you know, a lot of people, if they got a conscience, is on vacation. But they didn't get that way overnight. You know, some guy in California last week beheaded his girlfriend. You know, you didn't get to the point where you could actually behead an individual. A rapper just got taken out, you know. Uh, now, he was a gross rapper. But his girlfriend um, kind of put out on the me in media, we were at this chicken and waffle place. And he was all, all in flashing money and, and the jury. People showed up and killed him in the restaurant. You know. You don't get to that point without hardening yourself over time. The violence we see now is an evidence of a defiled conscience. Amen? And the Bible said that in the last days, a preeminent thing we would see is people without natural affection. You know, you don't get that way overnight. Some of the things that we're seeing now, we couldn't have imagined just five years ago. Amen? But notice the Bible says, but, but to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. So if someone is not a believer in Jesus, they're apt to do anything. So we shouldn't be surprised. Amen? But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. The last verse he says that they profess that they know God, They profess that they know God. But in works, <laughs> there's a song I, I don't know, it has to do with, but God, some hip hop song. They ain't talking about the God of the Bible. Or they wouldn't be singing and doing what they're doing. But you notice these. The worst of artists, they get up, come up for an award. I just want to thank God. Huh? And if you talk about one, the beehive get mad at you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. She has to hear lyrics in one of her songs that she wipes her menstrual cycle using the pages of the Bible. And yet Christians will fight you saying that she's a Christian. See, the Bible says they profess that they know God. Amen? But in works, they deny him. What do you think that means? Paul gave earlier warnings to Timothy concerning having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, he told us what to do. From such, turn away. Amen? Just because somebody says they know God don't mean they know God. And then we have to, what, which God? There's only one true God, but there are a lot of little g-gods. And some people think they're little gods. Let's close out with this verse. They profess that they know God. But their lifestyle denies him. If somebody says they know God and they're living life, their life is the opposite of what God would approve. They don't know him. Pastor, you judge him. The Bible says a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. Amen? If someone says they know God, but there's no godliness to what they profess and how they act and how they speak. Now, I know that somebody can be saved and, and they still can struggle in different areas. We're not talking about that. But if someone is living against, amen, they profess. 
and are defending their right to live that way. They say they know him, but in their works they deny him. Paul has some harsh words there. And he's not being mean. Amen. Because he's trying to bring them to a place of becoming sound in the faith. Amen. Because a lot of people think that, you know, they can do anything and still be a believer. Amen. That they can add anything to their Christianity. And they can profess that they know him. But what he manifests denies him. Hmm. In other words, we shouldn't be walking contradictions. Amen. Yeah, it might take a little while to produce fruit, but it, eventually the tree ought to have some fruit. Amen. And so if, but he says in works they deny him. That means they go opposite of what he says. And what they outwardly do and practice, they deny the God that they say that they know. And that's what we see a lot today when it comes to issues of, of faith and morality and how we ought to live. They say, yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian, but. Well, one of the things there is there, well, uh, I'm not saved, I'm spiritual. That should be a tip off right there. Amen. But, but when the works don't match the profession. Now, I can believe wrong as a new believer, but I shouldn't de de be in denial about what the Bible says. God is right and I'm not. I might not aspire to the highest that God has said, but that's what I'm striving to do. See, that should be our upward progression. We should be sharing things that um, aren't approved of by God, not trying to embrace them. Okay, let's close out. It says they deny him. Now, notice it says when they deny him, they are being abominable. What's that abominable mean? It means detestable. So they're not just doing stuff. They're doing really rank stuff. Amen. Uh, they deny him being abominable. Actually, that word means disgusting and um, disobedient. I love doing these little word studies because that's saying, well, I just won't do it. No, it's much stronger than that. Disobedience there, if you look it up in the Greek, would say unpersuadable. You can't move them off that behavior. You can't, they can't be persuaded. This is where they stand, and they're arguing, fighting you over that. These are the ones that he's talking about that they deny him being disgusting and unpersuadable. They don't want to be won over. And then he said, and disobedient, which really means you can't win that individual over. And to every good work, reprobate. It sounds like he's being hard on the folk in this church, but he's cutting out what can harm them in their life and them they're developing their development and teaching them what they need to resist. Amen. The word reprobate there means a castaway. You know, it's an athletic term that means, you know, if you're going to run the race, you need to play by the rules. See, if someone says that they know God, but they deny, deny him in practice, they're not playing by the rules. That's disgustable to God. It's an abomination because they're trying to come another way, another way to the salvation he paid for to give us freedom. That's why it's an abomination. They insist on their way, making themselves unpersuadable. When Jesus said, look, it's not the heart. I'm the way. You need to come my way. Yeah, but I, no, no, you have nothing to do with it. That's why most religion is work-centered. It's what you do to get right with God, not what he did so you could get right through receiving his son. Amen? And if you insist on having your own way, you'll become, in that sense, reprobate. In the end, you'll be cast away. Then play by the rules. You're not getting to the gates, and Peter saying, no, not you. You don't get near the gate. You go straight down. We have to do it God's way, don't we? Amen. And even if it's a believer, amen. Now, Paul lived, 1 Corinthians then, he said, I, 
I beat my body. I, I bring it into subjection so that while I preach to others, I myself might not be a castaway. Well, that word there meant reprobate, but it didn't mean he lost salvation. It meant he could lose some reward. You and I might lose reward if we don't do right. But if someone th think they can get to heaven their own way, they lose eternal. They, lose, they miss out on eternal life. Amen? You and I need to play by the rules too. Amen? It don't cost us salvation. It can cost us reward. Amen? We want to live so we can have full reward when Jesus comes. Amen. And he's warning the church here and us certain things we need to keep out and separate ourselves from so that we can be approved and not disqualified. Um, you know, sometimes you can jump the gun. If you're racing cars, you can red light. You might be faster, but you still got disqualified. Amen. <laughs> you can get out the block when you're running a race. Yeah. And you can run the fastest time ever. But you're not going to stand on a podium, number two will, because you were disqualified. You didn't do it the right way. Amen. So we don't want to be castaways. We want full reward when Jesus comes. And so that means we have to watch out of ourselves and those that we know. We need to work to keep ourselves in order. Amen. To resist the sins in the city where we are, the place we find ourselves, one of the primary warnings to the church in Crete from the Apostle Paul. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to bless us, Lord, in our hearts as we receive your word, give us application. God, give us a sense of alertness to be on guard, to be watchful, to watch against things that will seek to creep into our lives, to diminish us, God, to compromise us. God, give us eyes to see. And God, we pray that if there's any areas in our lives where we've allowed hardness to creep in, God, we ask you to soften us. Amen. And Lord, deal with our conscience as well, Lord, that we might be sensitive and, and, and pliable in your sight in the name of Jesus. God, we give you thanks for it, and we give you praise. If anyone's here tonight not knowing Jesus, you say, Lord God, tonight, I want to get right if there's anyone. While every head's bowed, every eye closed, would you lift your hand? Say, Lord God, tonight, no more my way, your way. Amen. It's for you, Jesus, that I choose to live. You know, if you've fallen back and you say, Lord, I return, amen, just lift your hand in faith and we'll pray with you. And say, Lord God, tonight I want to settle that issue with you, God. I've allowed certain things to pull me away from the faith, but God, I return. If there's anyone, let's do it tonight. Let's do it now in Jesus' name. And God, we give you praise. Then. God, we pray that as we go from here, God, we ask you to help us, Lord, to um, continue to grow in the faith, God. Give us boldness. Help us, God, to use the opportunities that present themselves to redeem our time in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name.